Um, and I'd like to welcome everybody to this meeting, which is Fighting Austerity Across Europe. We've got an international panel of speakers. We're really looking forward, I think, to what they're going to discuss from their experiences of fighting back within their, within their countries. Um, we've got about 30 minutes for, um, dis from, for the contributions from the front and then plenty of time for discussion from the floor. Each of our speakers is going to speak for about 10 minutes. If people are interested in discussing some of the issues further or further reading, there are a number of publications available from bookmarks, including Kevin Ovenden's book on Syriza, Larry Elliott's book on why Europe isn't working, um, and a book called Austerity Island by Kieran Allen and Brian O'Boyle. Um, they all look excellent. Um, so I'm going to introduce the speakers turn by turn, and then, as I say, there's plenty of time for discussion. Are we going to be using speaker slips? Can I just get... It's quite a busy meeting. Yeah? No. Can I get a thing from one of the team about speaker slips? I think we'll take a decision to use speaker slips, I think, because it's quite a packed um, meeting. OK, so people, if you want to speak, have a look out for one of the team who will have speaker slips in their hands. Um, you write down your contribution onto there, and then that will be brought forward, and I'll take people in turn. Um, so... Our first speaker today is going to be Maria Stelou, who's a leading member of the SWP in Greece, and she's going to speak to us for about 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Next Tuesday, at 7 o'clock, there are going to be demos and rallies all around the country. You know why? We celebrate one year after the OHI in the, de in the referendum last year. So we've got really to celebrate a year afterwards that we continue the OHI throughout all our resistance, even in front, uh, even the government belongs to a left uh, party. It's an amazing change, but you understand one thing, why the ruling class puts all our hopes, all its hopes in a left government to be able to stabilize the resistance from below. That's a tremendous change. Do you remember very many times in Europe that the ruling class, the ruling class not only in Greece, but in Europe itself, believes that a left government can stabilize the situation because there is no alternative, not for the left government, but for the ruling class. That's the situation, how it has developed. And to tell you the truth, comrades, that's the way that is going to develop all around Europe. The signs are there. We seize the signs and we shape the future. That's how the things are going, really. Why this happening? It happens. Tsipras, the left government, is willing 100% to stabilize the situation. 100%. It takes all the, the possible measures, really, to control a situation where actually it's not difficult to control, because what happened is that almost all the workers that are now on strikes, all the anti-racist movement that is fighting for solidarity with the refugees, were the people that voted for him and gave him the power one year, one year and a half. And they are the people, actually, that responded to his call last year, this time, for a referendum to vote OHI for the new memorandum. So he thinks that it's, it's in the, he, the people are in his pockets, that he can control him. So when he's, and he cannot, when he started, of course, the memorandum had OHI. You know, like your memorandum had OHI. So their memorandum had OHI. And what he hoped is that, uh, OK, now I'm uh, under pressure, and I'm going to sign a new, uh, the, 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 sorry, not the memorandum, the uh, referendum was no. And he believed that he can sign a new memorandum under uh, exactly that he can control that there wouldn't be resistance. That's what he believed after uh, one week after this OHI, and he signed. And actually, he moved a bit further. He called snap elections. 
because he believed that this, he can win the snap election that he won actually in September, and then he can move on with all his plans, with all his attacks, using a sole argument. That the argument is that we, we can uh, really, uh, we have your uh, ohi, but we have also your decision to vote for me, for, to vote for the, again for a left government, even if you knew what we signed. And then that's the only way. And that's what he thought. And he started really taking different, signing the memorandum and taking different measures. And his argument no. is, is not my choice, is not my program, my program is different, but I don't have any other alternative. And you know what the answer is from the workers, all right? What is our program? To your no alternative is our strikes. We stick to our program, and you don't stick to your program. So we are going on. That's the way, really, the first reaction after the September elections We've got to take the consideration because you've got part of the left saying, why they voted for him? Really, what they did in the, the ballot box didn't pay any, any sort of influence of what they did the day afterwards. So it's important. It's important that in the last year, after the referendum, after the snap elections, after Tsipras won a second term, really, uh, from the ballot box, Tsipras cannot pass one single attack without facing the workers' resistance, without facing uh, very solid strikes, what, without facing you, trade unionists that actually were elected under his own or Syriza, really, uh, sort of influence, to be against that and really lead the, the strikes. So it's, it's a tremendous change, comrades, if you think that a left-wing government just elected a hope of everybody in Greece and all around Europe that actually started very quickly under pressure and under uh, backtrack to have a very uh, strong attack and to sign a memorandum, to face really such a, a workers' resistance inside Greece, it's a tremendous change. It changed that can shape really, and it's the idea of how we can shape the world and Europe as it's changing. The second thing which is very important, the second change is that this actually uh, you can say these strong parts of the working class and the unions that were the, uh, the, the backbone of the resistance against the third memorandum was the backbone of the solidarity for the refugees. And we've got to, to have that in mind. There is no, as Rosa Luxemburg said, there are no Chinese uh, walls between political and economic struggles, between economic struggles and political struggles. And then, that you can see really what's happening. The moment really that the working class had to face the second challenge, the thousands, hundreds of thousands of workers from all around the world entering inside Greece and eating shelter, food, uh, health, schools, protection, every possible thing. The working class, the same working class was there really to develop and be the solid really force that was behind uh, this whole solidarity campaign. It wasn't a solidarity, a humanistic solidarity. Of course it was humanistic. What a bad about humanism. He wasn't a philanthropist. He was a solid working class, or you can say the working class was in the front and was attracting and influencing everybody else of how they can build this solidarity. It's an amazing thing, Syndrome. <coughs> comrades, comrades, we have the, 
this ex exactly this solidarity that actually can deal with one million new worker, workers and peasants that came from all around the world, they can really deal with that. And creating from chaos order is actually what the working class can do all around the world in every crisis. Whoever says that the working class cannot solve this crisis because it's huge, it's all around, not the capitalists can solve. Hey, hell, you see really, in a, in a few months, they can control a situation for all the society where everybody can eat, <coughs> everybody can sleep, everybody really can deal with his life and her life all around and cut, cut the possibilities of the far right, cut the possibilities of the fascists to come up and protect really the conservatives, the Greeks, those who didn't have work and all this. Tremendous change. And the third thing, comrades, is this has the results on the left. Tremendous changes. Syriza now has a party that doesn't control anything inside the party, at least the base of the party, at least the people from the party. At least the majority that voted them. It doesn't control even what's happening outside the society. The reaction and the resistance and the ideas outside the society. The two examples, because I know I don't have time. Two small examples. What's happening in the unions? In the unions, the left now comes first. In all the public sector unions, it's amazing, in the elections, in the public sector unions, people, the workers are not disappointed if they don't vote for the left. They're not disappointed because the left party, the left government betray them. They vote for the left. They vote for the left means they vote for CP, <coughs> where? They vote for Adalcia. They vote even for Syriza because they know that they control their un trade unionists, their leadership, ir iris irrespective of what Syriza wants. And that's true. It's amazing. In the unions, the three of them are the majority, even if they, they are in, in different, let's say, <coughs> under different slates, they are the majority, and they, they, they work together. So you've got in the workplaces You've got in the trade unions all the left working together against the government, against the measures of the government. More than that, it's, the, it's in the unions that started a new, really, uh, campaign now. Open the borders, open the cities. Open the cities means that open the schools for all the children of the refugees. Open the hospitals, open the hospitals for all the refugees, which means they combine now and they've got on strike in the first of, uh, in the beginning of September, they go on strike, exactly dealing with the things. We want more people working in the hospitals, we want more people working in the schools, because really we want everybody to be able to have an education. Everybody, even the children from the refugees. That, that's the situation. So they, they don't just initiate a solidarity, they initiate a, a step forward to the situation where it happens. <coughs> so this is the situation that is Can you developing in Greece. Please? Yes, it's the situation that is developing all around the world. The left is under new uh, pressures, really, to deal with this situation, to deal in three fronts. The first is that to deal, really, with the problem of perspectives, the problem of strategy. And it's an open discussion. It's, a, it's true that the idea is that the left government can really solve the problems of the humanity, or at least the problems of Greece, or the problems, really, of uh, the, the, the attacks, etc., is dwindling away. The questions are open. How we are going to deal with this? And the, the, the examples are there. So from this point, the crisis of Tsipras is big. 
the questions of how we can deal are open, really, with open, that, f to the Maria, left, can you the sum left up, and please? the revolutionary left. Thank you. So the revolutionary left is under tremendous, tremendous pressure. Their, their duties are enormous, comrades, are enormous. And that's the way that is developing in Greece, in France, in Ireland, in, in Britain, and all around Europe and I'm saying in all around the world, things are changing. This time, we are not going to miss it. We are going to grab it, and we can shape the world, not by apathy, not by big dreams, by, but by activity, common uh, activity, fights on the ground along with all the others. So our second speaker is Vanina Gidicelli, who's from the NPA, which is the new anti-capitalist party in France. She's going to be speaking with translation, so Denise is going to be translating for her. On a reçu une information aujourd'hui euh, qui illustre ce qui est en train de se passer en France. Le Parti Socialiste, qui est donc le parti au gouvernement, organise chaque année une université d'été à Nantes, une des villes en France. Et cette année, le secrétaire national a décidé de l'annuler face à l'énorme euh, révolte populaire contre sa politique. Uh, we just got an information, just before the meeting, that the, uh, the leader... Uh, the Socialist Party is organizing a uh, sort of university, summer university every year. And uh, so the, uh, the leader of the Socialist Party announced that they had to cancel it before, because of the pressure, because every time they are organizing some meeting at the moment, there are some protests. Ce que je voudrais essayer de raconter euh, dans mon introduction, c'est vraiment le, ce qui est en train de se passer en France depuis plusieurs mois et euh, ses particularités. C'est un mouvement inédit pour nous. Uh, what I would uh, uh, talk about is about this uh, movement at the moment in France, uh, its lengths, its forms, and how it's a peculiar movement and it's uh, completely new in some ways, inédit. Ok. La première chose qui est inédite, c'est que depuis des décennies, on n'avait pas vu un mouvement qui a duré pendant plusieurs mois. Ce mouvement a débarré au début du mois de mars et il est toujours en train de se développer. The first thing is the length of this movement because this movement began four months ago and this movement is still going on. Il prend plusieurs formes qu'on avait déjà vues dans les années précédentes, puisqu'il y a eu des mouvements de grève à répétition dans les différents secteurs, avec le 31 mars et les 14 juin, par exemple, plus de 1 million de personnes dans les rues. Il prend différentes formes, avec un mouvement, avec quelques grands jours, par exemple, le 31 mars et le 14 juin, il y avait plus de 1 million de démonstrateurs dans la rue. Les secteurs où il y a les plus grosses concentrations de salariés ont mené des grèves reconductibles, et c'est le cas chez les dockers, les raffineries, euh, les salariés du nettoiement, les cheminots. Uh, and so there were some sectors, even with uh, indefinite or few days uh, on, on strike, and in the most important concentration of workers in France, like oil raffineries, uh, railway workers. Uh, il y a eu pour euh, les soutenir des opérations de blocage menées en collaboration avec la population, donc blocage des raffineries, blocage des ports. There were some uh, blockade actions, blockade in ports, in uh, oil raffineries, with the support of uh, other sectors and local population. Et il y a eu aussi des choses qui s'étaient produites avant, des occupations, par exemple les intermittents du spectacle ont occupé des théâtres nationaux euh, pour protester euh, contre la politique du gouvernement. Uh, and there were some occupations, uh, for example the uh, cultural workers occupied some uh, theaters. 
Ce qui est inédit maintenant, c'est que cette séquence euh, n'est ne, pas simplement un mouvement de, de grève, de grève reconductible dans différents secteurs, c'est aussi une contestation, une remise en question générale de la politique du gouvernement et du système. Uh, what is new as well is that it's not just strikes and a specific movement against the law, but it's a, a general uh, contest and contestation uh, of, the, of the politics of the government and of the system. Le fait qu'il y ait des centaines de milliers de personnes qui se mobilisent contre la politique du gouvernement a aussi permis qu'il y ait des actions de solidarité avec les réfugiés, qu'il y ait des actions qui soient menées contre les meetings du Front National, qu'il y ait des confrontations qui soient menées euh, avec la police, qu'il y ait euh, un harcèlement en fait, des euh, personnalités du gouvernement avec euh, des milliers de personnes qui sont allées prendre un apéro chez Valls. Uh, and uh, you know the the and there's a d dynamic of this movement. It uh, braids some other action on on, on different questions. Uh, some uh, some demonstration against uh, National Front meetings. Some actions of solidarity with refugees. Uh, some uh, confrontation with the with the police. And uh, so all this harassment of the uh, government figures when they were trying to have some public appearance. Et pour la première fois, on a vu dans les manifestations euh, la jeunesse euh, former un cortège de plusieurs milliers de personnes en tête de manifestation avec des slogans anticapitalistes qui ont cassé des banques, des assurances, avec également des occupations de place qui ont réuni des milliers de personnes chaque soir dans plus de 60 villes en France. And, uh, there were this, uh, and there are these this huge contingents which are called now head contingents in, uh, in every demonstration with mainly young people but thousands of uh, young people having some uh, anti-capitalist slogans you know one of the famous now slogans in these demonstrations are, are anti-capitalist anti uh, not just from small contingents but uh, thousands of uh, young uh, uh, people and, uh, and workers, but not just these kind of slogans, but attacking the, during the demonstration, attacking the banks, uh, insurance companies, uh, uh, confronting the, the police. Okay. Ce que je voudrais essayer d'expliquer maintenant, c'est d'où vient cette situation en France. And what I would like to explain is where where this situation is coming from in France. Okay. Uh, depuis la victoire de Hollande, la majorité des organisations à la gauche du Parti Socialiste ont essayé de résister uh, aux mesures d'austérité, mais principalement sur le terrain économique. Uh, since uh, François Hollande was elected in uh, 2012, uh, organizations on the left of Socialist Party try to resist Uh, but only against austerity as specific measures. Elles ont sous-estimé à quel point les politiques d'austérité étaient un projet global d'attaque de la classe ouvrière. Uh, and so they underestimated uh, the point uh, how the, the, the austerity measures were a, a general politics against everything uh, for the working class. Par exemple, en, le 13 novembre, le soir, enfin, le soir même du 13 novembre, quand il y a eu les attentats à Paris, Hollande a directement annoncé qu'il fallait attaquer la Syrie, fermer les frontières et mettre en place un état policier, l'état d'urgence. Uh, for example, just uh, on the evening of the bombings, horrible bombings on the, on the 13th of uh, November, uh, Hollande went on the TV announcing that they, they were going to attack Syria. Uh, Fermer les frontières. Uh, close the borders and, uh, and proclaim the uh, emergency state. La conséquence directe, ça a été des attaques massives sur les musulmans en France. Ça a été une attaque massive sur notre possibilité de manifester ou de faire grève. And uh, the first consequence was massive attack against Muslim community in France, but as well against our right to strike and to demonstrate. La conséquence, c'est que oui, des gens à partir de là, à partir de ces attaques réactionnaires, se sont euh, reportés sur le vote Front National. Ce qui a été sous-estimé, c'est aussi le fait qu'il y a toute une partie de la population pour qui ça, ce n'était pas admissible et qui se sont mis à continuer à se mobiliser, mais de façon locale ou de façon... Euh, sur des fronts spécifiques. In fact, it, it feeds the National Front vote 
on one side, but the other, on the other side, people began to mobilize, maybe at first on local uh, scale, but to defend their right to uh, mobilize and to fight. Quand le gouvernement a annoncé son nouveau projet de loi pour attaquer les salariés, ça a été la goutte d'eau pour l'immense majorité de la population. And so when the government announced the labor law and this massive attack against all the workers, it was, uh, I don't know the word in English, the last drop for, okay, <laughs> last drop. C'est essentiellement à la base que la, la, la mobilisation s'est organisée. Dans les universités, dans les lycées, dans les quartiers, sur les réseaux sociaux, une pétition qui a fait plus d'un million de signatures. Ce ne sont pas d'abord les organisations qui ont impulsé la mobilisation, ce sont tous ces tissus militants qui, depuis des mois, essayaient de se mobiliser contre le gouvernement. And the launching part of the of the movement was not coming from the traditional organizations, but it came from uh, university students, uh, school kids, uh, uh, social networks that launched and there were a petition with uh, one million votes against the law. C'est ce qui explique ce phénomène des occupations de place qui ont permis des discussions politiques sur la question de la démocratie, sur la question des institutions, sur la question de la police et aussi tous les autres sujets comme l'écologie, euh, quelle, quelle autre société on souhaite. That explains as well, you know, the phenomenon of the occupying places, squares, uh, where there were some discussions, not, uh, not only about austerity and the law, but uh, a, a, a large range of subjects. Ce qui résume le mieux la situation à l'heure actuelle, c'est ce slogan qui dit qu'en France, on se mobilise contre la loi travail et son monde. Uh, what, what is a, a good example for illustrate what's happening is that this movement is mobilizing. Uh, there's a slogan that's one of the main slogan against the labor war, against the labor law and its world. Ce mouvement là va continuer. Il y a encore une nouvelle journée de grève et de manifestation la semaine prochaine à l'occasion du nouveau vote à l'Assemblée nationale. And this movement is not finished and it's going on and there is uh, uh, Two next day of uh, action and demonstration and strike uh, next week uh, on Tuesday and on uh, next Tuesday and Thursday. Oui, on, on doit dans cette situation combiner le fait d'essayer de convaincre la majorité de, de la société de se mettre en mouvement. Aujourd'hui, 70% des gens soutiennent la mobilisation, mais tout le monde n'est pas encore dans les manifestations. We, we, we need to combine, uh, to try to argue, to mobilize more and more the population, because there are at the moment, still after four months, there are still 70% of the population against the labor law, but it doesn't mean that these 70 people are active inside the movement. Combiner ça avec participer aux expériences de confrontation que font des milliers de personnes aujourd'hui dans les manifestations. And uh, to combine this with uh, participating to this experience of confrontation with uh, the government and the state inside the, the demonstration that people experience in every demonstration. Et juste pour terminer, en 2017, il doit y avoir en France des élections présidentielles. And to sum up, in uh, 2000, in one year, time in 2017 there will be some presidential elections in France. Et ce qui se discute sur les places occupées à l'heure actuelle, c'est que ces élections ne se déroulent pas comme elles se déroulent normalement. And what is uh, a discussion in the in the occupied place and different uh, places in France at the moment is the idea that these elections should not happen as it happens uh, usually. Thank you. Our final speaker will be Richard Boyd Barrett, who's from the SWP in Ireland and a member of Parliament for People Before Profit. Yeah, the, the experience of Ireland over the last uh, eight to ten years uh, is, I think, a fairly textbook example of the complete bankruptcy of a reformist strategy and particularly a reformist, well any reformist strategy, but uh, in the European context a reformist strategy that 
has illusions in the willingness or capacity of the European Union to do anything even remotely progressive. Um, but in, con in contrast to that, uh, the bankruptcy that, of that strategy that has been exposed in Ireland, uh, we see running alongside that the uh, confirmation really of uh, the efficacy of a revolutionary strategy uh, and a revolutionary strategy that focuses on struggle from below as uh, the key means uh, to resist and overcome uh, the austerity attacks that are being rained down by Europe's elites uh, against working class, uh, against working class uh, people. Um, a short summary of that story. Um, the Irish economy collapsed in 2008 uh, after a long period of sustained economic growth that was pumped up uh, by the greed of the Irish rich, but uh, financed by the European uh, Central Bank and the European uh, bankers who pumped enormous amounts of money into the hands of the Irish banks and the Irish rich uh, to generate uh, an absolutely extraordinarily uh, enormous uh, property bubble, which, needless to say, uh, at a certain point, uh, collapsed. Uh, when that collapse uh, occurred, uh, the demand of the European uh, authorities, in particular the European Central Bank, uh, was that those banks had to be bailed out to the tune of 64 billion euro. This is in an economy which, uh, where GDP is 160 uh, billion euro, so you get some sense of the scale of that, and that money that had to be pumped into the European banks had to be paid for uh, with absolutely cruel and savage cuts in uh, incomes, in uh, public services, uh, slaughtering of the numbers of people working in the public service and health and education uh, and housing, slashing of incomes to the tune of 20 to 30 uh, percent, a range of absolutely vicious and cruel cuts against the disabled, against single mothers, uh, against uh, pensioners. You can go through the list. Every vulnerable group you could possibly imagine uh, 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 refugees and asylum seekers, uh, everybody. Um, and it, it, when, this, uh, when this demand was uh, for this approach to the crisis was uh, demanded by the European Central Bank and the European authorities, uh, the government, who broadly speaking, uh, who had presided over the boom and the mad policies that had led to this, did make tentative efforts to say, well, maybe we should be a little bit fairer in how we deal with this. Uh, and Jean-Claude Trichet, the head of the central bank, told our Minister for Finance, if you do not do this, exactly as we're telling you, uh, if you make any attempt to burn the bondholders, uh, we will uh, destroy your economy. Uh, this has come out in a, in a report that was done into the banking crisis, where Trichet refused, incidentally, uh, to come to the uh, finance committee that was investigating uh, the banking crisis to explain his role in this, but it emerged in the evidence that that's what Trichet told the Minister for Finance. Subsequently, uh, there was an election. Needless to say, the government that had presided over all of this was destroyed in what was really a riot at the ballot box. Fianna Fáil, the party that dominated the Irish state uh, for its entire history, more or less, was wiped out almost entirely and was replaced with a government, another party of the centre-right and a record vote for the Labour Party. Both of these forces, who then formed a coalition government, gained power in 2011 on the promise that they were going to get tough with Europe, that they were going to stand up to Europe. It was going to be, to quote the Labour Party's leader, leader's uh, election slogan, it was going to be Labour's way, not Frankfurt's way. Uh, there was not going to be another cent, according to the leader of the other party, given to the bondholders. Uh, within a week, and again we've only discovered this in the, in the last while, in a week of that government being elected, the Minister for Finance rang up uh, Trichet and said, we would like to impose some losses on uh, senior bondholders. Uh, Trichet said, if you do that, 
I quote, we will let off a financial bomb in Dublin, uh, which will bring the economy down. Uh, the government, within days of being elected, did a U-turn and did uh, Trichet's bidding and continued the vicious austerity uh, assault. Uh, and the consequences of that are absolutely diabolical. We have the biggest housing and homelessness crisis in the modern history of uh, the state. Thousands and thousands of families and children living on the streets, living in emergency accommodation. Uh, we have a chronic uh, crisis in our accidents and emergency uh, uh, services uh, where people are lying on trolley trolleys for days waiting for treatment, dying on trolleys waiting uh, for treatment, two and three year waiting lists uh, for operations for where people are in chronic pain or are suffering from cancer, uh, and you can just go through the list. I mean, it's, it's too long to enumerate the cruel cost of all of this uh, on uh, people. Poverty rates gone through the roof, suicide rates gone through the roof. Uh, so it's a bleak picture, and this is a, a picture uh, that ge is generated um, in the last five years by people who promised to do the opposite and who believed that they could negotiate a fair resolution to this with the European Union uh, and we discovered the real nature of the European Union in that uh, process. Uh, however, the news gets a bit better from here. Uh, thankfully, there was a revolutionary current, small revolutionary uh, current, uh, that existed uh, uh, and that uh, had faith, basically, in the capacity of working class people to resist. Uh, but most importantly, the working class themselves resisted. Initially, that resistance was uh, quelled by the hopes that the Labour, Labour Party in government would bring about change. The trade unions encouraged people to demobilise, to get in behind the new government, uh, but that could only last uh, for so long. Uh, although the unions, it has to be said, even now continue to try and keep a lid on the resistance of the organised labour movement against, uh, you know, in the face of absolutely extraordinary attacks, uh, austerity attacks on the organised labour movement. But the resistance found another expression, uh, and that expression was seen most dramatically uh, on the battle against uh, the water charges. Uh, but that water charge struggle, and it was very much a sentiment that was acknowledged by everybody and uh, expressed by all of those who mobilized on the streets against it, was just the straw that broke the camel's back. This was our chance to hit back after seven years of being attacked on every single front. And there was an elemental, unprecedented explosion of popular resistance over the last two years that brought... Uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people onto the street in, the, in a sustained campaign of mass resistance and civil disobedience and boycott against the imposition of water charges by the Troika and the government. And the scale of it, as I mentioned, and apologies for those who were at the Irish meeting yesterday, was truly, truly extraordinary. On the biggest day of mobilization, but this was, I mean, we had at least eight or nine of these mobilizations, but on the biggest one, we had 250 to 300,000 people on the street, which if you translate that into numbers in, in England, is about six million people on the street. Uh, it's absolutely extraordinary. Um, faced with this, and two years of this, the government obviously hoped to wait this resistance out. There was police repression against uh, those who were boycotting the charges and who were trying to prevent the installation of water meters uh, to, to help facilitate the rollout of the charges and so on. All of that was faced down by this mass movement uh, of resistance. And in the last week, literally, uh, that campaign achieved uh, if not 100% victory, essential uh, victory. The, uh, there was an election a few weeks ago. Uh, such was the pressure of this movement that a majority of those who went before the electorate, not just of the left and the revolutionary left, but even of the centre-right, were forced pre-election to give commitments to get rid of these water charges. And within uh, a week of, uh, a few weeks of this government being formed, as I said, this week, uh, they've suspended the water charges, they're gone, and nobody believes that they are ever coming back. Uh, and the story gets better from there. In the same week, 
uh, an attempt by the privatized waste industry to introduce uh, massive hikes in waste charges uh, of the tune of two to three hundred percent, which shocked people. Immediately, spontaneous protests began to burst out because people had learned the lessons of the water struggle, and within a week, the government stopped it, uh, completely stopped uh, the cuts. Uh, and uh, also, this has begun to seep into a new level of confidence in the organised labour movement, uh, most uh, clearly manifested in the strike of the Lewis tram drivers, uh, who put in a pay claim for a 50% uh, pay increase. Uh, they didn't win the 50%, they were vilified in a horrendous way by the entire political establishment, but they won an 18% uh, pay increase. And... All of this has also now seeped into confidence in other areas. So a long-standing fight in, in uh, Ireland is to fight for abortion rights, which have been denied by a conservative Catholic political establishment uh, with terrible, terrible consequences uh, for women dying uh, in childbirth and so on because of uh, not being allowed uh, access to abortion. But again... Uh, the, it is almost certain we have now submitted a bill, the, the newly strengthened revolutionary left in the parliament, uh, who gained extra seats in the parliamentary uh, elections, really as a result of our involvement in that mass movement, has also now submitted a bill to repeal the Eighth Amendment, which is the amendment that prohibits abortion in Ireland. And everybody knows that this um, referendum will happen in the next year and will be passed and we will have abortion rights uh, in uh, Ireland. So... I just want to conclude by saying uh, that, um, you know, there's a very mixed picture in Europe and one could easily, and I think some people in the left in in England at the moment are somewhat demoralised when they look at the rise of UKIP and they look at the rise of the far right in Europe and racism uh, and uh, so on. And of course, these are very, very serious dangers and uh, threats. But as Maria has outlined, as our French comrades have outlined, and as we are seeing uh, in a a huge way in Ireland, that where the left is involved in building mass resistance against the austerity that can breed that racism, uh, that is the force that can not only deliver the hammer blows and defeats against the austerity merchants, but can also destroy the conditions in which the racists thrive and try and deflect anger uh, against immigrants and uh, other, other scapegoats that they choose to single out. Because the other feature, and I'll absolutely conclude on this, is because of the effectiveness of the mass resistance against austerity, and the success of the revolutionary left in uh, being at the centre of building that, we have no far-right party at all in Ireland. At all. Uh, And... it's not, to say, it's not to say that there isn't racist sentiment that we have to combat, but Pegida made an attempt to organise a demonstration in Dublin, uh, and I think they had about 20 people, and they were met by four or 5,000 people saying, no way. So, fight resistance, fight it from below, and build a revolutionary organisation that has no illusions in the European Union or in the parliamentary road to socialism. Um, Whilst he's coming up, I'll just ask a question from Richard Purdy from Bradford. So it's a question for our French comrades. The rank-and-file activity against government austerity is inspiring, but what are the prospects for the development of a revolutionary socialist organisation to unite all these fights? So that's a question for you. Um, So you've got three minutes, and I'll tap on the mic after two. Okay, thank you. Uh, Richard finished with the question of the pessimism of so much of the left. And you know the thing is this. There are two Europes, aren't there? There's two Europes, neither of which know any borders. There's the Europe of the rich and the powerful, the the, the Europe of the bankers. They have no borders, they have no boundaries. And there's the Europe of us, of our class, and that knows no boundaries either. Because what we've heard today is that the question of austerity, which we face here, is precisely the same question of austerity that workers face across Europe. And that isn't a question, therefore, of saying that can be resolved by looking to the institutions which are imposing that austerity. You see, there is an element of parochialism, uh, I believe a, a very strong element of parochialism, in the way in which some people are looking at the question of Brexit. 
Because it's all very well saying, oh, well, it's going to affect my ability to go on holiday. And maybe that's parody in some, the way some people have put it. But unfortunately, other people have said, well, this is a question of European solidarity. Well, actually, if it is a question of European solidarity, it's European solidarity with the people who are struggling in Greece, who are struggling in Spain, who are struggling in Ireland, and so on. And that is not a question of solidarity which the European Union offers to anybody. We've got to make that clear. We've got to understand why it is in Europe, people looking at the Brexit vote, look at it through the prism of austerity being posed by the very institution which people in Britain voted to leave. That's what we've got to understand. Now, as Richard rightly says, the question of fighting austerity and fighting racism are inextricably linked. It is very, very important that we build that resistance to austerity and that we also, as we have done in the SWP, say we stand with the people who we believe mistakenly associated Europe with a fight against xenophobia and racism. We stand with those people in the resistance against racism. But we've also got to understand this, that the question of austerity and the question of the fight against austerity is reflected in that vote. You see, the thing is this, when I talked about there being two Europes, if you go to places where I live in Newcastle, you go to the old pit villages, you go to Middlesbrough, you go to Teesside, you see the effects of austerity on those people. You can understand that they have more in common with the workers of Greece, with the workers of Ireland, with the workers in, in France, with the poorest sections of Europe than they do with the bankers and the rich. And that's precisely why we understand that their sentiment in saying two fingers to Europe isn't simply a question, as some people have suggested, of xenophobia and racism. It's a question of saying we're sick to the back teeth of austerity, of being ignored, of being treated like shit. So consequently, what we say to the people who are marching today to say we want to revisit that vote. We say if you want to march on the streets, you want to march in solidarity with the struggle of the workers in Greece, with the struggle of the workers in France, with the workers across Europe who are fighting the austerity which knows no boundaries. You do not want to be associating yourself with the organisation which is imposing that austerity on those workers and they're resisting because theirs is our Europe and the bankers Europe is theirs. So the next speaker will be Panos. So the next speaker will be Panos, who will be followed by, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, Iru, Iru from the IS in the Netherlands. If you'd like to come up to the front, comrade, then be ready. There's a lesson to be had, comrades, from uh, what we have heard from the speakers and this picture across Europe of workers fighting back against austerity. The worst mistake that the left can make is to underestimate the strength and the anger of the working class. There's a sustained campaign to, to do exactly this. I mean, everywhere. In, in Greece, you know very well in, in, in this country, after the referendum vote, uh, there's a campaign to say, well, you know, uh, the workers effectively are a backward lot and can be manipulated into all sorts of, of ideas. Um, the same is said in Greece. Um, well, they voted for the left, they've, they, they've brought Syriza to, to government. Now they're having the taste of, of betrayal. What will happen? They will go home. They will be demoralized. And the same applies to, to France. For years, we've, we've been hearing that, well, the, the workers in France have become, uh, um, how, how you call it, reactionary. They, the voting intentions show that they support uh, the Popular Front, the National Front, uh, Le Pen, and so on. It, in reality, what is happening, this, this common sense is given the lie everywhere. Obviously in France, where the people who would write off the French workers now have to see that uh, the workers are fighting back on a long, sustained fight. Um, the same applies in Greece. 
the mood is not disappointment. The mood is to the left. The mood is that if the government, if the ministers cannot deliver, we have to take up the fight ourselves. This is what's happening. Uh, for, for a government of the left with a very recent mandate to, to try to uh, push through austerity, they had to wait until Easter week when Parliament was in recess to recall Parliament and call a sudden vote on, on, on that bill to try and avoid the strike. They didn't avoid it. Even, even, even with people away for the Easter break, uh, there was a general strike against Parliament voting uh, the pension bill. So I think these are steps that, that show that the reality is the opposite of what they are trying to say to us. The workers have had years of suffering. They've uh, radicalized through this. And the anger is breaking through in many, many places. They, they, there was this stupid story that, uh, you know, a, a short he's while ago that, that in Greece people would say, we are not Irish, we fight back. That, that, that nonsense was propagated through, through the media. Well, now we know uh, the answer to that story. The Irish are fighting back better than the Greeks. <laughs> Um, I'm Ebert from the Netherlands. It's very inspirational to listen to this uh, panel discussion. In the Netherlands, we're not as fortunate as having this high level of uh, class struggle. Um, we're into our third year with our present government, which consists of the Social Democrats, or Labour kind of party, together with uh, Tories. And there's been a very low level of a struggle, but they've been imposing uh, quite harsh austerity measures. Um, public housing, which was uh, being privatized uh, um, student grants which were abolished, uh, the healthcare uh, privatization really accelerating. Um, and I want to deal with some of the reasons I think that this uh, level of class struggle has been very low. I think the first one is that the ties between the Labour Party in government and the union bureaucracy in the Netherlands are particularly uh, interwoven. So there's a revolving door between the Labour Party and the union um, uh, presidency. So this is really, you know, um, making the union even less likely to, to come into action. I think the second reason for this low level of struggle is also um, the, the weakness of the radical left. So for example, we have the Socialist Party, which is the largest party to the left of the Labour Party, which is looking ex uh, almost um, exclusively to Parliament rather than to the streets or to the working places in order to build resistance. So they really want to be the next in government rather than building uh, the resistance and getting the uh, Labour and Tories out. Um, and you see the same weakness of the radical left also within the unions where we have comrades, for example, who are affiliated with the Fourth International and they've been really, um, try, because of the weakness of the resistance on the streets, really accepting more and more positions within the uh, union bureaucracy. So it really also dampens the, the, the networks which are really being built, developed from below. Uh, the third reason for this low level of struggle is also the rampant racism in the Netherlands. So, for example, many of you know of Geert, Geert Wilders, of course, and he's really been the driving force of the, um, the political discussion moving to the racist right. Um, but you see it throughout the whole of politics. So, for example, the Minister of Finance, Jeroen Dijsselbloem, also the chair of the Eurogroup, he said that refugees throughout Europe are blowing up or like uh, demolishing the welfare state. And this is from the same person who is also also demolishing the welfare state throughout Europe. So these kind of uh, traditions really weaken, um, uh, weaken the resistance uh, and, and um, need not really fostering. But I'm also pos uh, positive about um, uh, perspectives. Over the next year we will face um, the next elections, probably will be an even more right-wing government. There's um, the public debt, which was used as an excuse in order to push through austerity, has only doubled since the beginning of the crisis. So I think it's only a matter of time when people come into action. Uh, and I think one of the best uh, ways of building the resistance in the Netherlands is around the uh, uh, TTIP treaty, which is being forced through, which is really a way to unite all of the left around the different uh, issues, for example, BDS, climate, all these kind of different uh, Comrades. Things are coming together, so I think hopefully next year we'll have a more positive story here. Sorry, this oh, yes. 
Uh, thank you. Um, I just want to start. I'm from uh, a town called High Wycombe, which is 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 what it's a very it's got large areas of deprivation in, and it's in the southeast. And there, and these are the sort of places that sort of get glossed over as rich and affluent. And we and we're actually the places that get hit by austerity the most. And um, I think in this whole debate, uh, the thing that has really been glossed over and isn't talked about too much is the human impact of it. So I'll give you three examples. One of my uh, members of my family worked in the NHS and she specialised as a midwife for Pakistani mothers, Polish mothers, Romanian mothers that couldn't speak very good English. And the Sure Start centres used to employ interpreters and two or three years ago these interpreters were seen as a necessary cut. So now what do they do? They, they just assume what, they, what they're saying which leads to higher deaths in pregnancy because, you know, you can't, you can't train every nurse to speak Urdu, for example. Um, and also, I'm involved in a, in a local campaign group that campaigns to get 50 refugee families into our uh, district council area. Uh, they, couldn't accept, they said they couldn't accept it because there wasn't enough counter housing. And then, then one councillor, who was from UKIP, said, uh, well, why not accept 10? And they couldn't accept that. Um, and this is because they're using... The Tories are so hypocritical in the way they do things. They blame the austerity that they welcome for not standing in solidarity with refugees who are more safe on deflated dinghies than on dry land. So that, so I want to just highlight the, just to, you know, the, the awfulness that they have been portraying at a local and national level. And also, austerity has completely destroyed many working class communities. For example, my granddad was a steel worker in Glasgow. <coughs> during uh, the 1960s, all the way through to the 1980s, he lost his job, job under Thatcher. And I wonder if the government had been, you know, a, a less small state, you know, small government uh, administration, they could have maybe invested in the vital industries that made up entire communities in order so that they could keep their jobs and they would in turn be paying into the system to prevent further austerity. Um, so I've, I've said three, about three things that are affected by austerity. Three things that should be cut is... Trident should be cut. That's costing way too much money and we cannot afford it. <laughs> MPs, our MP, we live, we're, we're 20 minutes outside of London, yet he has one house in London, one house in Wickham. I think we should be paying for his train, train fare, not for him to have two luxury accommodations. <laughs> and the one last thing we need to cut is taxes for working class people. The people with the broadest shoulders should be paying for... Um, you know, the NHS, etc, etc not the poorest people in society it's absolutely ridiculous that, we, that the government's cut inheritance tax, yet they've cut uh, vital public institutions that the poorest in society rely on the most and also austerity is driving people to organisations like UKIP through no fault of their own so if we want to stop the rise Mr. of far right so if we want to uh, stop the rise of far right parties in the UK and across Europe we need to stop austerity and we need to find a progressive solution in order to regain working class support for vital organisations like this and other uh, organisations thank you Uh, Albert Rivera is the latest spoiled child of uh, Spanish politics. He is the leader of the so-called uh, Citizens Party, uh, part of the right in, in Spain. And uh, usually he has a, a, a silly smile on, on his face. Uh, he doesn't change it. Uh, the, the only days that he changed it was uh, a few days before and after the referendum on, on Brexit. He was trying to be serious on the television to, and uh, to say that it's very irresponsible uh, of David Cameron to call these uh, to call these referendums. He was lecturing David Cameron of not being uh, right wing and serious enough, and uh, he was really really very upset what was was uh, what was happening. He was saying uh, these things are very important to ask the people for uh, for their opinion. The gov we have to have serious government to decide about it. So first of all, thank you for uh, rubbing the smile out of the face of uh, uh, of Albert Rivera and of Rajoy and uh, all these days. It was very, uh, but. Uh, one, one of the, his arguments was that 
how come David Cameron cho chose these days to, to hold a referendum when we, ha we have this danger of instability uh, uh, for many, many factors, and especially because we have uh, these elections here in Spain uh, in the same week? And actually, we can, we, can blame, we can blame David Cameron for many things, but not for the Spanish po uh, politicians uh, not having been, been able to form a government in the last 200 days. The, the, uh, it's their problem, and the, and the problem goes on. But I think it's important to see how, how, how um, uh, very afraid they are of, of instability wherever it comes from. Uh, the media like uh, focusing on, uh, on the situation as uh, still uh, photos. You know, uh, on December the left went up, on June the left went down. Uh, okay, that's uh, part of the reality. But we have to see that there is, uh, they are afraid because there is a resistance uh, growing in, in the last years in Spain that hasn't let them, hasn't let them implement their, their, their program. And they, are, they know that with the government they're going to have, it's going to be even more difficult for them. Yesterday, the, the vice president of the European Commission on Euro issues, he said that he had an interview on the Spiegel, the German magazine. He said that the first thing we have to do is to impose sanctions on Spain and Portugal because they are very late into imposing uh, the austerity, to impo imposing cuts. They need... Uh, something like 20, 20 billion pounds uh, cuts, more cuts in the, last, in the next two years. Uh, and they know that they have a, 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 a movement that hasn't let them go like this. Just an example, because I don't have, don't have time. Two years ago, when there were the, the, the um, Rajoy government was trying to impose limitations on, on abortion rights, it was a very big thing for uh, that It was a, a turn to the right, a, 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 a way to, to, to turn the situation to the right. They scrapped the, the plans. The, the, the minister went home. They didn't do it. Uh, in the same, the same week, the, the same weeks, the, the King Juan Carlos abdicated. It was those days. Now we know that, uh, because, you know, they got, they got, uh, he, he had his uh, leg uh, hunting for elephants in, uh, in Kenya, so we knew, we knew where he was. But uh, uh, the same, we know that the four people he called before abdicating to, to discuss with him were the two leaders of the, of the main parties and the two leaders of the trade unions, the one led by the Communist Party as well, to tell them, I abdicate, don't call for um, demonstrations, don't call for, for, for strikes. It's very, the situation is difficult, and of course they said yes. They said yes. But that's their fear. That's their fear. What we do in situations of such instability? Apologies to people that have indicated. We've actually had quite a number of people indicate by hand, so, so this one will be the last speaker. Hi. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, well, first of all, thank the comrades for coming from where they've come from to share their stories with us today. I think it's really important that we, that we have, you know, these forums like this to do this, because actually, if you was to rely on the newspapers or the news to let you know what was going on with working class people in countries like France and Greece... Uh, you would have absolutely no idea. It's been disgusting, actually, um, that the press have chosen to completely ignore working-class struggles uh, uh, around, around Europe and around the world, but particularly what's happening in Europe at the minute, given what we're all discussing. Um, in light of that, I think all I really want to say is... Um, I actually don't work anymore, I'm retired, look at me. But for all of you people out there that are going to go back to your communities, your workplaces, I, I beg you, take this with you, because actually it's down to people like me and you in this room to share these stories and this working class struggle that's going on across Europe, because, because no one else is going to do it for us. You know, we need to make sure that we bring these stories into our own workplaces, our own communities, and in that way we will give strength and confidence to our own struggles here and actually bring together that solidarity of Europe that so many people who are against us leaving seem to wish to want and that is a much more positive way of working together so I urge you all to please take all take the struggles from that you've heard today and make sure that you that you spread them amongst your workplaces and your own communities thank you okay so I'm going to ask the speakers to sum up for three minutes each starting with Richard okay thank you I, I think it's been a very good discussion, and I think the, the, the message really is uh, very clear uh, that uh, resistance is inevitable, really, given the sort of austerity uh, assault that uh, Europe is engaged in, and the fact that it hasn't learned a single thing from the crisis. Uh, the policies haven't changed a bit. The very policies 
that led us into the crisis in 2008 are uh, being accelerated, actually accelerated. TTIP being the most uh, you know, clear-cut example of this. And it's, the madness of it is, is beyond comprehension. You know, I mean, we, we, we had the worst economic crisis in modern times as a result of the crazy uh, deregulation and privatization of the financial and housing markets. So what do we do now? Let's have more deregulation and more privatization of health, of transport, of, you know, everything. Uh, and imagine that the results are going to be uh, any different. Uh, so w we are facing into a period of protracted crisis and uh, there is going to be uh, resistance. And the important thing is really not to lose sight of the centrality of the struggle of working people and ordinary people uh, in, in, in prosecuting that fight and getting uh, progressive, uh, progressive uh, results. And I, I just want to say, I mean, I've given a good news story in terms of the, the escalation of resistance and now the sort of domino effect that is beginning to happen where people have seen that people power and struggle works and it is getting contagious. That is essentially what is happening. It's becoming a contagion and it is breaking out in every single area of struggle in, in places where we were on the defensive for the last uh, 20 years, we are now on the offensive, and the establishment are weak, they're divided, uh, they're, fra uh, they're fragmented. Uh, and, but in those battles, and I just want to reiterate this point as my, you know, as my concluding point, we need to explain that to bring these battles to fruition, we are going to have to bust through and essentially destroy the European Union. Uh, and is, uh, we need to be absolutely clear about this. I mean, I haven't got time to go into the, uh, the details of it, but just to say, the EU Commission has already tried to intervene to overturn the result, the, 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 the abolition of water charges. They won't succeed because it will provoke another mass revolt, but it is the European Union who's trying to do it. The European Union is saying we can't even spend our own money on providing the council houses that we need uh, to deal with the housing and homelessness crisis because it would be distorting the market. It would be unfair state aid distorting the market. The state forestry company that they tried to privatise but we stopped is incredibly not allowed to do new planting of trees. The state forestry company because it would distort the market uh, and would be unfair state aid. And this goes on. This goes on. I mean, we were talking about climate change and sustainability, and the European Union says the state forest company cannot plant new trees. I mean, you couldn't make this stuff up. Right? So in order to, uh, in order to uh, break through on environmental fronts, uh, in terms of uh, opposing austerity, uh, in, in terms of dealing with the housing crisis, we are going to come up against the structures of the European Union and we have to smash uh, through them. And in particular, and I just want to absolutely conclude on this point, on the issue of defending refugees and migrants. It just... I just want to read these figures to you. Of the EU allocation of funding for refugee integration and external borders, look at the breakdown of the expenditure. Bulgaria, 4 million given to refugee integration, 38 million given for external border control. Uh, Greece, 21 million given for refugee integration, 207 million for external border control. That's barbed wire, police, drones, helicopters. Spain, 9 million for refugee integration, 289 million for external border control. Italy, 36 million for refugee integration, 250 million for external border control. Malta, 6 million for refugee integration, 70 million for external border control. That's why 30,000 people are drowning in the Mediterranean because a bloody fortress Europe, we need to tear it down. So Denise is going to sum up on behalf of the MPA. Yeah, what I want 
strongly to argue because I support the argument from Maya and Panos that the, the time is not for pessimism at the moment. And uh, that in France, what the movement illustrates, what Vanina uh, said at the beginning, the main thing, is that the eruption is not a specific movement against one law. It's a political eruption. And that's what, you know, I will come finish with the question about the revolutionary in, in France, but that's what the left in France has not understood with the movement at the moment. You know, we said in the, inside this movement that the, the engine of the movement was a global angriness against the system, and it was expressed through the, the occupation of this place. And the occupation of this place really played a crucial role, not just to have, you know, some, it was downplayed, even in the radical left as, you know, people who came just to have some abstract discussion. That was not the case. On this place, there were a lot of discussions, but very interesting discussion, as in Marxism you know, about the system, about democracy, about violence, about the state, about strategies and, and so on. All these kind of discussion. But not, not only that, there was some action from the beginning. There were a, a large range of action from the place. On the evening, there were this wildcat demonstration, leaving the place with hundreds of, of, of people going in, a, in the place, in the uh, popular areas in Paris, where the government and the, and the city hall, you know, where they expelled the camps of refugees. After that, they put some fences for everybody, not, et, nobody can go uh, back in these zones. So there were some demonstrations starting from this place to destroy these fences and say we free freedom for, for refugees and freedom for our local area. There were these uh, demonstrations leaving to go to occupy some banks, these kind of things. And quickly, some uh, demonstrators uh, leaving this place to go to support some strike pickets and to blockades and so on. So there were connections, and it, it was a few. It was the engine for the for the larger movement. The result, you know, there were a lot of debates about confrontation with the police, and the government tried to split the movement between the youth uh, uh, attacking or confronting the police and the rest of the movement. On the 14th of June, there were one million demonstrators in Paris. There were a contingent of dockers. There were 2,500, you know, with the drums and. You know, it was very impressive. They were not only the head contingent confronting the police. At the end of the demonstration, the dockers attacked the police as well. So that was the kind of connection between the, between the two movements. And we have to understand as revolutionary that this movement, what happens is political at the moment. You know, we are going and we are going in a general confrontation between the politics of the ruling class and the resistance. Every time that the resistance is taking place, it has to affront the logic, the, the old logic of the system. And I just finished about this question of revolutionary left. The tragedy in France for the uh, radical left is that the radical left has always been and it's still very pessimistic. And so don't understand what is going on at the moment. Just look at an economical uh, sort of social movement, a sort of something that is going to stop. And after that, we will have the electoral perspective. That's not what is happening. There are now tens of thousands of young people and workers who are talking and who are discussing what are the perspectives to fight against the old system. And that's what we have to address now because, you know, we, don't, we have to not to be pessimistic but to be realistic because in France, you know, all the <coughs> retard, I don't know how we say that because we are late compared to the great comrade or, or you here in terms of organizations, is that the result is that we have a national front, a fascist party, which has 25% of the vote at the moment. And so if we are not building this perspective, using what's happening in the movement at, in, in, uh, in, uh, now, right now, you know, the situation will be very difficult for the future. Quarter of an hour? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Two minutes. When you talk with Tony Cliff, he used to say, when he gave you the, his idea about the revolution, he said, the revolution, my idea is that will happen in the US, will lead by black people, and uh, the leader or the president of the Soviet will be a woman which is going to be lesbian as well. <laughs> That's his idea. <laughs> All right, we don't know if this is going to happen, 
But what we know is that the Brexit in um, Britain gave us an idea that the revolution will start from, from the richest, from the most control, for the, from the most important countries in Europe and all around the world. That's the Brexit, comrades. If you don't take that, not because the revolution is going to happen in a linear way, but you don't take that as the biggest challenge of capitalism, as the biggest the challenge to the parties that are ruled up to now, to the biggest challenge actually of the idea of pessimism and keeping to the back, to the biggest ideas for the revolutionary left to lead at that time, then we lost. Fortunately enough, the people in Greece don't have this idea. In today's uh, sort of gallop, most of the people that voted for uh, the referendum OHI last year, they said, most of them that voted actually for Syriza, they are saying they are for Brexit. They felt that the Brexit here is the best thing that ever happened and gives them hope. That's how we deal with the results, comrades. Otherwise, we lose the train, and we think um, what I said about a, a very abstract way of how suddenly, really, the things will clarify and people will vote in our way. No, it's really a big challenge for capitalism. It's a big challenge for the left. That's the first thing to start. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> because that's the way, really. I mean, we've got really to, of course there are uh, differences between the countries. The uneven development doesn't exist for capitalism. It exists for the movement as well. It exists for the working class. The comrade came from uh, uh, Netherlands and reminds us of this fucking diesel bloom that comes every year in the Greece and says, those are the rules, etc. I understand, but things can change very suddenly. Can you imagine really the Brexit in here? Can you imagine that Marxism this year will talk on a very different way, really, that it used? You, it used to be, yes, we've got this campaign in the other. Now what we discuss is we can shape things, really. We can shape the whole of working class. We can really uh, drag with us all the Labour Party. And, accept, and give them really all the, our attitude. That, that's the way that things developing. So whatever is happening to each country and the other, and all, all those things, because the things are moving, we've got to, to prepare ourselves. And prepare ourselves, I come to the last thing that they said. I mean, the Revolutionary Party and the anti-capitalist left is very important. Is really the salt of the earth of how things are going to develop. And because it's the salt of the earth, we need really tremendous, tremendous power, and we've got to build that. So it's, it's really not only to recruit, but really to be inside all those things are happening, inside all those resistances, Can you inside please, all comrade? those movements. Try to shape them. Try to, to take an, our own way and try in the same time to recruit them to the revolutionary situation. This is the things. Of course, it's tactics, it's how we do it in different situations, but don't, don't confuse the tactics with where we are going. And because we are going there, even in France, I know uh, France is a pe uh, left is pessimist. Even last year, Denis was in Greece and he was very pessimist. Now, he really flies in the sky. I mean, it's different. That, here's how things are happening. You remember? <laughs> It's everywhere. We can fight, we will win. Yeah.